Hello, and welcome to Up to Speed with Online Teaching. My name is Jonathan Haber, and this short course on creating effective assessments and assignments for online courses, uh, this video is going to begin the content development process, focusing on what are called linear test items. Now, if you've been following along so far in this course, you know that this course is based on the backwards design process. This is a process used by professional test developers and many educators to create effective assessments and assignments, and involves going through a series of steps. You've already been introduced to goal setting and planning, and in this lesson, we're going to begin the process of learning about content development, focusing on different types of assessments. Okay, so uh, keep in mind uh, there's different sorts of assessments and different sorts of assessment items. Uh, so far in previous videos, I referred to linear assessment, uh, but these are just the sort of test items that you may be familiar with. Multiple choice, multiple response, which is a multiple choice question with more than one answer, short answer, fill in the blank, matching, etc. These are the kinds of items that are easy to deploy via online learning. Right? They're built into learning management systems and other tools. Uh, most people are familiar with them from standardized tests uh, and tests we've taken back in, in, in going all the way back to grade school. Okay, this is in contrast to performance-based assessment where you're evaluated based on performed activity. Okay, And that activity might be an interactive simulation, it might be an artifact creation process, such as a written essay, but it could also be like a lab report, a computer program you create. Uh, performance can be based on contribution uh, into discussion groups, group projects, et cetera, or observed behavior, such as an observed presentation. Okay, this lesson is gonna focus on linear assessment. And before I get started, I just want to highlight, since many teachers, uh, especially in higher ed, uh, may have a sort of, of low opinion of kind of multiple choice kind of tests, considering them to be just uh, uh, ways to measure lower order skills or knowledge or maybe lower order thinking skills. Now, well, this should be a concern. I think it's also important to understand what you can do with linear assessments, especially since, as you'll see towards the end of this lesson, there are ways to make use of linear assessments to measure more complex abilities. Okay, so hold that in the back of your mind for now, um, because this lesson is really for everybody. And so as we talk about linear assessment, I want to begin with the anatomy of a linear assessment item. Okay. In a linear assessment item, the text that's sort of asking you to do something, what's sometimes referred to as the question text, in testing terms, that's referred to as the stem. Okay, the correct answer is simply called the answer. And all the wrong answers, in this case, the wrong answers in a multiple choice question are called distractors. And the answer and the distractors taken together are referred to as the responses. Okay, one other term you should know about is exhibit. An exhibit is some piece of information required to answer the question. In this case, it's an image, but it could be a reading passage. It could be a video or animation. Uh, it could be all kinds of things. And uh, I'm a big fan of exhibits, and I'll explain why in a little while, but they can be used to create linear test items that measure quite sophisticated skills. Okay, so now that that vocabulary is out of the way, uh, let's talk about some of the rules for writing good test items. This is probably the longest list you've seen so far in this course, and I'm gonna make sure that any version of this course has access to a PDF version of this list. So, uh, but I wanna spend a few minutes uh, going through items on this list, since this is really the, um, the, the, the steps that professional item writers use when they're writing test questions that are often uh, not used by all others, including many educators. So I want to go through this list and explain some of the reasons why uh, these are good rules for writing good test items. Um, okay, so for starters, each item should measure a single clearly defined objective. I mentioned in the last lesson when we talked about objectives that uh, you don't want one item that is measuring two objectives because if someone gets it wrong, you don't know which objective they might not know. Uh, also, items should be written in language that is at or below the average reading level for students targeted by the assessment. 
right? If it's a reading assessment, you obviously want to be at the grade level. But if it's a science assessment or some other kind of assessments, you don't necessarily want complexity of language to get in the way of somebody demonstrating their knowledge. So generally, professional test developers write test items at the fifth or eighth grade level, even if the tests are being delivered to uh, high school or college students. And that's just a way of making sure that language doesn't get in the way of answering the questions. Uh, speaking of writing, uh, items should be clearly written, unambiguous, free from cultural bias. Uh, when we get into responses, okay, those responses should be of equivalent length and arranged in some logical order by length, alphabetically, or some other form of, of, of logical order. Uh, a mistake many kind of, of test item writers uh, make who are not experienced is the longest answer is correct, or very frequently uh, it might not be the longest answer, but uh, the third answer, answer C, is correct. Uh, these are common errors, and uh, if you make your responses of equivalent length and arrange them based on some order that you have no control over because it's length or alphabetically, for example, you could avoid these common mistakes. Also, this is an important one. Um, I highly recommend you avoid true-false items because a true-false item, that's really a multiple choice question that has just two answers, one right, one wrong. And I don't think you'd write a multiple choice question like that, so why would you use true-false items? Uh, you should also avoid multiple choice items responses like all of the above or none of the above or A and C, uh, those kinds of responses. Again, your guideline should be um, if you've never seen an item uh, look like what you're writing in the SAT, you shouldn't be, it shouldn't be in your test. And you will not see a true false item in the SAT. You will not see a none of the above, all of the above question in the SAT. Uh, these those tests are developed by professional test designers and professional item writers do not use those kind of questions, so neither should you. Okay, moving right along, uh, distractors, the wrong answer should be all be plausible. Okay, there shouldn't be an obvious wrong answer and ones that are a little bit more plausible. They should all be equally plausible. Uh, you should avoid trick questions or questions with, with uh, jokes or, or humor in them. Um, multiple response items should indicate the number of answers in the stem. Uh, exhibits should relate directly to the test question, not provide distracting or extraneous information. And finally, you should avoid items that may disclose answers to items and other items in the test. Uh, you don't want the question seven to give a clue to what was on question one or vice versa, especially in an online learning environment where students can uh, jump around, can go back to questions, et cetera. So make sure you don't disclose answers. And, and if you want a general recommendation, especially when you're starting out, I would recommend primarily using multiple choice items with four responses. That's a, a question with just one correct response or multiple response item with five responses and two correct answers. Okay, I know that was a lot to digest. And as I said, a document that uh, has all this information in it will be available. So, uh, but just keep in mind, these are all the steps professional item writers use. And so there's no reason you should not as well. And let me give you a few examples to chew on, okay? Here's a test question, okay, it needs some work. A binary number consists of what digits and the uh, answers kind of uh, arrange the numbers randomly. Uh, but we can revise it and specify in the stem, select the two digits that make up the binary number. So students know in this multiple response item, they have to pick two answers. And in this case, we've rearranged the answers so that the uh, all the responses are in a logical order, they're in numerical order. Okay. Here's another item with a problem in it, and I'm going to take a pause for a second and see if you could figure out what's wrong with it. Okay, I don't know how many people guessed this, but in fact, this item has a problem with cultural bias because in some parts of the world, lemons are green and not yellow. Okay, this is an analogy item. I've used it as a simple example, um, but if we wanted to create an analogy item that would not have cultural bias, we might want to use something with more widespread universality, like as uh, stop signs or, or red lights and green lights, uh, stop is to red as go is to green. Okay, so these are simple examples of problems, but also how problems with test items can be easily fixed. Um, speaking of fixing or renovating a test item, read through this item and uh, think about if there are some ways to make it easier for students to understand what's being asked. Okay, I'm guessing if you read through the item as a whole, you probably felt the, the, the wording was somewhat confusing. 
And part of the reason the wording is confusing is that this is a sort of negatively phrased item. This is an item where uh, usually it's, it's phrased something like all the following are correct except, you know, so you basically, instead of having three wrong answers and one right one, you have three correct answers and one wrong one, and the stem asks you to select the wrong one. Okay, and this is made even more confusing by the fact that you have to have like a separate instruction on how to answer the question. But what you really want to do is you want to avoid all situations where the wording of the question is getting in the way of somebody understanding what's being asked of them. Okay, you may be in a situation where a sort of negatively phrased question is the only way to, uh, to, to ask somebody uh, a question that covers a learning objective. But my experience is that's very rarely the case, right? In this case, uh, we can renovate the item in a positive direction. I'll let you read this. And I think I hope you'll see that um, by phrasing it in a positive direction, we're able to cover the same learning objective, but with a question that is not so confusing. Okay, moving along, I want to give you an example of an item that I think is quite good. Uh, this is an item uh, from a uh, chemistry or biology class. As you can see, each response is an image, an illustration of a molecule. It's a multiple response question. And right there inside the, the stem, it's telling you that there are two correct answers. So you know how many answers to select. Uh, and the distractors, I'm, I'm not uh, quite experienced enough, but I would seems to me that distractors are, uh, are plausible. So in this case, this is an effective linear test item. Okay, now I want to move into another type of linear test item, which is open-ended. Uh, sometimes fill in the blank is a phrase people use to refer to items like this. Okay, and for starters, if you think about it, a fill in the blank item is an item where there are an infinite number of distractors, right? This field requires numerical input. There is a correct answer, or maybe a, perhaps a range of correct answers. But every other number, you know, from negative infinity to infinity is a possible distractor. So this is a way to make your test items more challenging. And if you look at this item, if you read it through, you'll see there's a lot going on in it. A student actually has to do things in order to answer the question, right? They have to extract information from the question stem. They have to go somewhere. They have to go to Wolfram Alpha and look up information in order to perform a calculation that will allow them to come up with a number that will answer the question. So even though this is a linear test item, this is an example of how a linear test item can be used to ask students to perform some sophisticated activities, in which case the linear test item just simply becomes an input device for them to input the results of those more complex activities. Now, open-ended test items are uh, obviously very useful for questions that have numerical answers. They could also be used for questions that have uh, uh, short word answers like vocabulary questions so that all vocabulary questions don't necessarily have to be uh, multiple choice. Okay. But uh, let me give you another example where a linear test item, in this case, a multiple choice test item, can be used to get students to perform complex activity, right? In these two questions, students have to go to a website learn something from that website, and then come back in order to answer the question correctly. I could create a performance-based activity that has a linear question as input, right? I can ask students to um, look up something on the internet or go visit a museum or do something, uh, hopefully once the crisis has passed, you know, go to the end of the street and check out a street sign. And then the multiple choice question would ask them, you know, what the street sign is at the end of the street. Uh, that's a way to use linear test questions to give students the ability to input the answer to a, a more complex activity or performance task. Okay, so as we kind of wrap up this discussion of, of linear test questions, I want to just leave you with some general guidelines, especially since many teachers may have experience writing linear test items, but as I noted at the beginning of this video, Many may not. So I want you to keep in mind a couple things. One is that item writing of any sort is as much an art and as it is a science. Okay, I've given you some principles that uh, people who do this for a living uh, use. So, but you, you will sort of develop your own skill as an item writer as you do more of it. I okay. uh, just want to really emphasize again, every item should be designed to accurately measure a learning objective. Uh, your planning process would make sure you don't have 
multiple test items that are covering one learning objective and no test items and another half dozen learning objectives. So there should be a real tight correspondence between your items and the learning objectives you've listed in your planning documents. Okay, as I just noted, remember that linear items can give students the ability to input the results of complex activities. So I hope you've seen uh, from the examples I've shown you that linear test items don't have to just be about the sort of lowest common denominator or knowledge or low level skills. They can be used for much more than that. Uh, also keep in mind, there's a lot of linear assessment content out there for you to tap into. Uh, publishers include them with book adoptions. There are websites that include uh, linear test questions you could utilize. Uh, you could be sharing tests and test content with, with colleagues and friends and fellow teachers. Okay, and just keep in mind that what you've learned, uh, particularly in this lesson, will help you evaluate the quality of third party content as well as your own. Okay, and with that, Covered, we're going to move on to the second part of the content development uh, process, which is creating performance-based tests.